Okay, that's great. I think we'll make a start now. Um, and obviously we might have some people um, coming in and joining along the way, but thank you very much for everyone who has joined. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And thank you again for joining us for our first online forum of the week. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Victoria Walworth, Policy Projects and Course Manager at National Historic Ships UK. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, if anyone is having any difficulties, please do just send us a message on the group chat and we'll try our best um, to help if we can. Um, next slide, please, Cara. So hopefully you can all see on your screen right now um, the programme uh, for today. Um, our topic today is, of course, diversity and inclusion, um, and the discussion will run for around an hour and a half. Um, and we'll first be hearing from our three panel speakers who will each talk about their experience, um, as well as give some top tips for supporting and increasing diversity and inclusion in our sector. Um, we do hope, uh, we do ask, sorry, if you can keep your microphones muted and cameras switched off during the speakers' presentations, um, just so that we can avoid any disruption. Um, there is a chat function, however, and we'd love it if you could all just introduce yourself and say hello to everyone, maybe where you uh, are joining us from. Um, and also, please do use the chat function to share your comments. Um, and if you have a question for any of our speakers, um, please could you post it into the chat during the event? And um, we'll be answering as many as we can in the Q&A after the presentations. Um, also, just to make you aware that we are recording this session, so we can share a link with you uh, once the event is, is finished, um, as well as share that to anyone who wasn't able to attend today. Um, and finally, this is a live event, and so we certainly hope that we don't have any tech difficulties. Um, please do bear with us if we encounter any problems. Uh, next slide, please, Cara. So before we start, um, I just wanted to give a bit of background to this event, which we're hosting as part of our lottery funded Shipshape Heritage Training Partnership Programme. Uh, since 2014, the scheme has delivered 26 training placements in partnership with nine vessel operators and museum sites. Uh, we're now coming to the end of the second phase of this project, and our core aim throughout has been to address the growing skills gap that risks the loss of traditional skills and techniques involved in conserving, handling and maintaining historic vessels. Research revealed to us that an ageing workforce and lack of training opportunities was at heart of the issue. And so SHTP was set up to attract young people aged 18 to 30 to the sector. The project also recognised the need to open up opportunities to a wider range of people, and in particular wanted to address the lack of representation of women and Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to briefly share a few strategies that we employed to attract a diverse range of candidates to the training scheme. Uh, working with our partners, we looked at traditional recruitment methods used in the sector, and across two cohort intakes, we developed a simplified application process, which didn't focus on pre-existing qualifications, something that may put many people off actually just applying because they feel underqualified, um, but instead focused on finding out more about their interests, long-term goals and soft skills like ability to work within a team. We looked at where we we're advertising the traineeships, um, identified key regions to target, and worked with an extensive list of external organisations and local councils. We also made use of Twitter and Instagram, which are more popular social media platforms for young people, um, using established, established hashtags to reach different groups. We also produced a number of short learning film, films at the beginning, uh, hearing from women working in the sector, along for, with alumni trainees from our first SHTP programme. And we hosted days for shortlisted candidates on board historic vessels that allowed them to find out a bit more about the work and what the programme would have to offer them in a less formal setting than an interview. And this also gave us the opportunity to find out more about how candidates interacted with different people and responded to the heritage environment. And we also consider things such as financial restraints, which could hold someone back. Um, so in the second year, for example, we addressed the need to introduce a London waiting for our Greenwich based trainee to reflect the cost of living. Um, and throughout the project, we offered a travel allowance for candidates to attend the recruitment days so that no one fell back um, felt held back unnecessarily. And we also developed a detailed learning program that included an extensive induction period and a specialist 12-week course at IBTC Lowestoft 
that together would enable trainees who had limited experience um, coming into the project to develop a sound base of knowledge and skill sets before heading to their partner sites. Uh, next slide, please. So did this approach make a difference? Well, over two years and 16 trainees, we recruited 11 female trainees, which I have to say exceeded our expectations. Um, two trainees from BAME backgrounds, and all of our candidates were aged between 19 to 32. And we learned some important things along the way, um, and here's just a few examples. We learned how to use inclusive language in our advertisements that broke down barriers, hopefully, um, or preconceptions at the very first step. And we learned that people respond well to inclusion. For example, we set up female-only days for potential candidates on board historic vessels, but found that the preference from the candidates was to join mixed days. And we also learned that post-recruitment, you needed to develop an inclusive work environment to retain talent. But one of the most important things I think that we learned was to talk and work with other organisations who were similar aims, both in and outside of our sector. Uh, next slide, please, Cara. So that leads me on nicely, I think, to our session today, um, which we hope will explore some of the key questions about developing a more diverse and inclusive workforce. We'll be talking about recruitment and the importance of hearing stories of people that you can relate to on the ground, um, working in partnership with different groups, using inclusive language, and about how to create a welcoming and safe environment. We're delighted to be joined by our speakers who come from different areas of the sector, but who are all very passionate about this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So first up, I'm very happy to welcome Hannah Herford, Chief Communications Officer at EcoClipper and also an alumna of the SHTP training programme, having completed a 12 month placement based at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. So without further delay, I'll hand over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as Victoria says, my name's Hannah Herford. I'm currently uh, Chief Communications Officer at a sail cargo company called EcoClipper. And I was an SHTP2 trainee from 2018 to 2019. And just a bit of background for me, I've, I've sailed since I was young on dinghies, yachts, and eventually tall ships and traditional vessels. And I'm incredibly passionate about maritime history and I love learning about it. Um, my dissertation at uni was on masculinity in Nelson's Navy and how it was represented compared to the realities of life on board a vessel at that time and their blurred gender roles. So this conversation is very close to my heart. Um, and we've we've already discussed uh, between ourselves previously that we're very aware we're not even a diverse panel, really. Um, and there are many different groups that should be represented and the maritime industry is still behind in attracting different groups of people. But obviously we're all here and it's these conversations that are vital and um, different organisations are using their expertise to reach more diverse groups of people. As Victoria just uh, went through the process for National Historic Ships and we hear more um, from, yeah, from later about that. And, but my job here really is to share my experiences being a woman in these still quite masculine environments, my experiences in the project and how it influenced my work today. Um, so I've experienced sexism, of course, throughout my time sailing and in the heritage sector. And I feel like I shouldn't have to say, of course, but we're still at a stage where most women have experienced sexism whilst sailing um, or in the heritage sector in some capacity. And when I was younger, I came to expect it despite having strong women in my life who are feminists and advocates for women's rights and equality, I still thought I had to keep my head down and just get the job done and do it in a way that I was accepted and respected by a male dominated work environment. Well, I think we all felt under, under pressure to kind of maintain that expectation, um, not to complain, not to be open with emotions, to show tiredness or physical weakness or anything like that. Um, and so I wasn't surprised, for example, I wasn't surprised, but I still had an underlying feeling of frustration that at a, a six week deckhand course on the Isle of Wight, when I was younger, out of 25, out of a group of 25, I was one of two women. And this does include tall ship and traditional sailing as well. Um, I would say I've personally found it slightly more inclusive. 
I've sailed under a female captain and female first weight mates, which I loved. And most of the time I've sailed with female deckhands and I've found it totally empowering. And actually the first tall ship I sailed on from Mauritius to Australia, there was a female deckhand and I completely looked up to her. I was completely inspired at the age of 18. Um, and I find inspiration in the industry now. Wherever I look, there are these phenomenal stories of women doing their thing. And it's so important to keep talking about them and encourage their growth within the industry. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is the, the group. This is my group from the SHGP project. Um, so yeah, my experiences with, within the project, I mean, I found it empowering again because I, I had my own space, I think. I was learning, I was doing, I was active. I was surrounded by amazing people who helped me in different situations throughout the year. And most importantly, I was in a safe space where I could do things in my own way and feel listened to. For example, each month we had blogs uh, that we had to write about our experiences. We had a vessel conservation course that run alongside it where we were writing essays. And we had the end of year presentations. And I also spoke at the UK Maritime Heritage Forum at the end of the year as well as an SHTP representative. So I was taken seriously, basically. And I wasn't part of a working gear at, at, to keep a ship sailing. And this was a really big change for me uh, in the maritime environment. Um, so at first, uh, we as a group were living on board different boats for the first couple of weeks in the southwest. I think that might actually be where this picture was taken, can't quite remember. Um, and we became really good friends quite quickly. And I personally am very used to uh, living in small spaces such as boats and ships. Um, although I'm not sure everyone else was as comfortable. And I want to make a, a quick point of it here, because when you're not used to living like you do on vessels, it can be incredibly hard. And unfortunately, there's the expectation that you can do certain things when actually you might feel really uncomfortable, be it due to gender identity, race, religion, sexuality, mental health. And an example that I can relate to is changing clothes. So I found it very difficult previously when I was, for example, sharing a foxhole with three older guys when I was what, 19 or something. And I was really conscious of my body. And I now only just about have the nerve to do it as a 27 year old. So I just want to just bring that out that throughout people might be experiencing things differently to me. But this is just what happened to me, I suppose. Um, but so after the Southwest, we went to Lowestoft and did a uh, build, boat building course. Oh, you can, next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, and then I went and did my placement at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Um, I was working with different teams, shipwrights, riggers, conservators, curators, archivists. I was just so fortunate to be exposed to those areas of maritime heritage, really fortunate, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, I also went on placements to the Scottish Fisheries Museum with Linda and the Cutty Sark in Greenwich. And throughout, I was introduced to men and women who were involved in all manner of the work. Um, what I notice over my time working in museums is that they are an interesting place to tell stories um, and how you tell stories, I suppose. And this has really affected my communications work today. So just a bit, a bit of background about EcoClipper. It's a startup that plans to build a fleet of clipper ships to transport cargo and passengers around the world. And when I joined the team, there wasn't much of a communications department. And over the last year, we've built up a solid foundation of followers and subscribers who are keen to see the project succeed. Um, of course, over the last year, all communications have been online and we had to tell the history of clipper ships, the stories of those on board, both past and present on sailing ships today, how sailing ships are used to influence the future of shipping and the image of eco clipper ships as part of a sustainable future, all online, predominantly social media. <laughs> so now the, the sail cargo industry has quite a few different companies involved. And some of the most internationally recognized sail cargo companies are run by women, such as Fair Transport Sail Cargo Inc. and New Dawn Traders. 
So why is it that EcoClipper's social media audience are predominantly male in their 20s or over 50s? And why, during a webinar series we held earlier this year, was it a white audience and predominantly male? I would love to think that the sail cargo industry is inclusive in its narrative. For me, it brings maritime heritage to the 21st century by discussing how these ships can be used for sustainable transport. But unfortunately, it's not. In my experience, a lot of people feel so disconnected with the story that they're only mildly interested in what I do and have done previously. Um, so this got the team thinking about how to target more diverse groups and particularly women. And we decided to do a series of interviews with different women in the sail cargo industry to share with our audience. And this interview series has become more of a collection of interviews with women in the maritime industry as a whole, which is really exciting for me because I get to conduct the interviews. <laughs> and I've had some great conversations with women and all of them have been completely inspirational. And some people argue that it's not necessary to highlight women in these roles and that it should be about the people doing it regardless of gender. But in my experience, these stories would be more inspirational for any person trying to find their way in the maritime world. And I think it's these stories that will influence future generations to get involved in the maritime sector and in a broader sense, encourage maritime heritage to have a sustainable place in the future. And I believe the world is changing and that the maritime heritage, maritime heritage industry must adapt with it. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Hannah. It's really interesting to hear about, um, you know, your previous experience and, you know, how you actually found the SHGPT programme um, and how that's influenced your career going forward as well. That's brilliant. And there's plenty that I know we'll get to explore more about in the Q&A there. Um, so thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to hear from Linda Fitzpatrick, um, curator of the Scottish Fisheries Museum, um, which has not only been a partner of, of SHTP from, uh, since 2014, um, but is also one of our Shipshape Network hubs in Scotland. Um, so as well as partnering with this programme, the Scottish Fisheries Museum has also taken part in the Kickstart scheme. Um, so I'll leave it to that and pass over to you now, Linda, if that's all right. Thanks very much, Victoria. Um, I'm just going to go over some of the experience from the, the host's point of view, um, having heard from one of the, the trainees. Um, and I've got the theme of removing barriers and creating pathways, which I hope will become clear um, as we go through. Um, next slide, please. So I thought I'd just start by giving you a brief introduction to the museum. Um, we are in Anstruther in Fife, in a collection of historic buildings right on the harbour. Um, and we are a nationally recognised significant collection. Um, and we have two operational vessels, um, which were key to our taking part in SHTP. Uh, next slide. Even more important than that, we're also a collection of people. And the these people are at the heart of the organisation and involved in a large and varied range of ways. And um, there's lots of ways to get involved from being one of the board of trustees, staff, obviously, a large group of volunteers, clubs, trainees, student placements, community pa partners, and of course, our audiences. So a large and varied group. Next slide. Um, but as Hannah was just saying, the perception of maritime heritage is, or industrial heritage more broadly, is still um, predominantly male, largely older. Um, and we were, we've been aware of these barriers for a long time um, with, um, you know, an aging volunteer force and wanting to pass those skills on. And just being aware that particularly younger people, they're, Maybe they don't have the money to, to volunteer, they're busy <laughs> earning a living. We're, we're in rural Fife, getting to us is an issue. Um, when, you, when you actually get to the museum and you see the volunteers at work, they're obviously competent, skilled, experienced people, and that can be quite hard to break into if you don't feel that you have that confidence or experience or knowledge to bring. So how do you actually break into maritime heritage if, if you don't 
look like the guys on this slide. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, Cara. Oh, sorry. I was just a bit of a time delay there. Um, so obviously it's partly around, as again, as Hannah was saying, um, about the stories that we tell. So we are very careful to show the role of women in the fishing industry and their role was considerable. Um, they were involved in preparing and maintaining fishing gear. They were in, involved in processing the catch, in selling it, um, very occasionally involved in actually catching the fish themselves, um, but equal partners in the industry. And for quite, quite um, lengthy periods of time, they would be in charge of household finances and you know boat ownership and all kinds of um, aspects that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of. Um, so we are very, as I say, careful to present women's and also children's stories in the stories that we tell inside the museum. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, and this also continues to the programmes that we run where we celebrate these stories and the wider aspects of the heritage of the fishing industry. So we look at some of the things that are traditionally seen as domestic or female, like the crafts and the artistry that goes in, that went into creating some of the domestic items and the, the knitted um, fishermen's gansies, for example. We actively encourage children to get involved in the boats, in our open days, um, arts and crafts, learning programmes, outreach programmes, and our it's phenomenally successful St Isles Skiff project where we actually looked at getting people on the water more generally based on traditional um, boat designs but aimed more at community groups and people who hadn't necessarily been on the water before or had thought of themselves as, as being connected to the water and looking more at um, issues around mental health and well-being and health in general um, and this is the, the launch of our first skiff with methyl sea cadets. Um, so we're just generally trying to broaden what it is that we convey as industrial heritage and maritime heritage and broaden the kind of people that we're reaching and the, the community partners that we um, collaborate with to reach, reach various audiences. Next slide. However, but it's still very gendered and it's still discrete groups, even within the museum itself. We have, you know, prior to SHTP, we had various um, avenues for people to get involved, as I say, through volunteering, through hosting school placements, through working with colleges where students would come and work as part of their um, coursework and do discrete projects for us, um, through advertising with voluntary um, organisations for specific roles. But it was very much the case that the younger pupils would work in the museum on the collections. Um, our older female volunteers, for example, would be working in the reception of the museum or as museum guides. And the boatyard and crewing the boats was still very male and very older, retired guys. And we discovered that actually removing barriers is not enough. What we need to do is to create pathways. And SHTP, among other, um, schemes allowed us to do that. And our, our first um, SHTP trainee, Kat, is shown in the middle there, um, working actually on the deck of the Reaper. So she was, she was a trailblazer from that point of view. Uh, next slide. So from 2014 with SHTP and then into SHTP2, and also we had uh, another funded program through the Coastal Communities Fund, we deliberately tried to encourage younger and female um, people to join our trainees, to join our boat side of operations. Um, I would say a key thing for us was the funding that came with these programmes, which through the Coastal Communities Fund, we were able to fund the employment of a boatyard manager. And that was, absolutely critical because he, unlike some of our volunteers, was willing to take on that role of supervisor and to see that the trainees followed a specific course and 
were safe and were trained in, in the skills that they needed and also were um, looked after and supported. Um, whereas prior to that, our boatyard had been basically the preserve of volunteers and their focus was on getting the job done rather than on supporting traineeships. And I think that was a critical thing to actually make sure that that support was in place before we brought the trainees in so that we could ensure that they had a positive experience. And um, so we had four trainees through the coastal um, communities um, boats, fish and folk project over two years. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we also had um, trainees through Museums Gallery Scotland and their programmes were targeted at um, people who were looking to work in the museum sector, so not specifically maritime, but museums where it's predominantly graduates, it's very middle class, it's actually predominantly female, um, but they were looking to um, target their programmes at non-graduates or people who potentially had not thought of a career in museums before. And that's where things like some of the um, more diverse means of recruiting came in as well, um, where it wasn't just sitting across a desk being interviewed by somebody, it was actually being involved in teamwork, doing group activities, and us as prospective employers observing the prospective trainees doing these activities and actually getting a more rounded picture for ourselves of how they would cope within the museum. And actually they got a, more of an insight into what actually working in a museum is like, because if you haven't thought of that before, you might not necessarily know. Um, next one, please. Um, and it also, it worked, the barrier, breaking down barriers worked both ways. Um, because, you know, as Hannah was saying, for young women, it can be um, intimidating to walk into an all-male environment. Um, and it can be, particularly if you, if you don't have the experience, you don't have the knowledge, and you're being asked to do something that's out of your comfort zone. Um, Hannah didn't come from a, a sailing background, so this was completely new to her. Um, sorry, this Hannah, two Hannahs, that's, that's confusing. Um, Hannah Fraser, our, our last um, SHTP trainee didn't come from a sailing background. So she was quite um, nervous about coming into the boatyard initially. Um, but I think also it can be quite intimidating looking from the other side. If you're a volunteer just doing your job in the boatyard, um, having somebody who comes who's coming in as as Hannah did as a graduate and they're having to work alongside you and have specific learning goals to fulfill and then you're just there as a volunteer thinking well I'm, and now I'm supposed to teach this person how do I do that um so having the structure um of the 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 course that SHTP provided was really useful for that because I think there was there was kind of fear on both sides um which is maybe not not always acknowledged um next slide so we have we have made some inroads um, through all of these processes and all of these things that we've, we've, we've gone through. We do now have re re regular female volunteers in the boatyard. Um, when we can have volunteers in the boatyard, obviously COVID kind of put a bit of a, a stop to a lot of our activities. We have had um, younger trainees, male and female, working in the museum with some of our older volunteers and our older volunteers have stepped up and actually alongside staff have begun to be less afraid of taking a little super bit of a supervisory role over the trainees um, and we've brought in some of our, our volunteers to teach the staff as well um, because again we're working in a maritime museum you can come in with museum skills but you might not have the practical hands-on skills that the guys in the boatyard do have and to try and get them into the museum and show that they've got something to give to us as well as us bringing trainees into the, the boatyard and trying to um, create that, that conversation both ways. Um, last slide, please. So as you can see from this, um, it's, it's, it's still very male. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't um, 
made great leaps forward. We have got a, a bit further forward. We, as I say, we have women now as part of the regular crew on board the Reaper. I think now that we're opening up again um, post COVID, we have our Kickstarter apprentice who's um, joined us with no previous museum experience and is, is working away really, really well um, and getting to know more about maritime heritage and really enthused about it now. So I think we, we just have to keep keep going the way we're going um, and keep making these pathways and making destinations and um, keep trying, basically. Um, we're not there yet, but we're, we're a bit further forward than we were. And that's me. Thank you so much, Linda, um, for sharing that with us. It's, again, really interesting to get that partner perspective, uh, not only of SHTV2 um, and that whole training programme, um, but just from the storytelling aspect of the museum as well. Um, and, you know, there's plenty that, that's sort of got mentioned there that hopefully we'll be able to explore a little bit more in the Q&A. But in particular, I think you make a really good point about the role that funding plays in actually helping us along with improving diversity and inclusion. Um, especially when, as we all are, you may have small teams that are particularly under pressure coming out of the last 18 months more than any other time, perhaps. Um, so thank you so much. Um, please, everyone, do share your comments and any questions that you have for our speakers. Um, we are coming up to the Q&A session and we will be picking these up um, in the last sort of half hour or so. But we'd really like to get a good discussion going um, around some of these topics. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, so finally, um, I would really like to uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Chrissy Clark, um, who is joining us from uh, Maritime UK. Um, Chrissy, over her career, has championed the importance of diversity and inclusion um, and has hosted a number of events looking at key areas um, around that topic, um, including areas such as mental health and well-being. Um, so very happy to now uh, pass you over to Chrissy. Well, thank you so much. Goodness, I have a very tough act to follow. Um, I loved Hannah's and Linda's um, presentation, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much as well for having me today. So as mentioned, I'm Chrissy Clark. I'm the Head of um, Diversity and Operations at Maritime UK, and I'm also Secretary to the Maritime Skills Commission. Um, so I've been with Maritime UK now for about 18 months. Um, I am an imposter to the maritime sector, that whilst I have family members that did work in the sector, I myself haven't. But I'm very, very committed and passionate about skills and diversity and inclusion. So for those of you that don't know, Maritime UK is um, the umbrella body that represents the five sectors of maritime, shipping, ports, leisure marine, engineering and science, and professional services. And we work very, very closely with stakeholders from across the sector and also with the Department for Transport. So when the Tran uh, Department for Transport released the Maritime 2050 People Route Map, in it, it said that we need to make sure that we've got the skills required as we move into the future, but to also make sure we're really diverse and inclusive. So my first slide just shows a bit of an interweave because um, Maritime UK, we've got kind of three key portfolios of work under the People Agenda. We've got the Maritime Skills Commission, the Diversity and Maritime Task Force, and also a Maritime Careers Task Force, because we really want to make sure that when we're talking about the skills, we go right back um, to uh, primary school aged children, but also right up to people that might be thinking about changing their career. So we need to make sure we're working with all the different areas. Next slide, please. So the way I tried to set up Diversity and Maritime when we launched it last May, which creates safe spaces that bring together people from across the maritime sector and allies to really share ideas, share what's working already out there in the sector. We don't reinvent the wheel, but also to have those safe spaces to kind of break down barriers for change. I call them my positive disruptors because we want to be disrupting the status quo. That's how we're actually going to make change. So we have four networks at the moment. We have our mental health and maritime network, we have our Women in Maritime Network, we have our Ethnicity in Maritime Network, and our Pride in Maritime Network. And each of those networks have named um, themselves, because I said he was never going to sit there and say, it's your network, or by the way, this is the name of it. 
but we also need to make sure we're working very much in an intersectional approach. So the chairs or the leads of those networks all form a task force. Next slide, please. So then we have working groups, because to be perfectly honest, D, D and I is a village. I'm never gonna be able to sit there and make all the changes. I need people from the sector to tell me what's working and what's not working. So when we try and create an initiative, because we can hear that there's a barrier being faced, but there's no solution, I then need people, um, passionate people from the sector to help me kind of create and test a program, initiative, a policy, a resource, um, and to then make sure they're actually being taken back into their organisations to really help with that cultural change internally. Um, next slide, please. So we have a number of kind of um, initiatives that are up there already. So I thought I'd just very quickly run through a couple um, and obviously make sure we've got ample time for any questions. So we have pledges. Now, I know you might be thinking, oh, for goodness sakes, another pledge. What does a pledge mean? Well, pledge is actually really important because we get leaders to actually make that commitment and that visible commitment to change. So we have um, our Women in Maritime Pledge, our Mental Health Pledge, which was launched in March. And most recently, our conference and events pledge, um, which is about making sure we have um, inclusive panels. And I know um, Hannah mentioned it here that, yes, we might not be the most inclusive of panels here, but certainly we're championing the change and we're aware of that. Um, but we also want to make sure that um, we are signposting to that and making sure that people are aware of diverse panels. Now, the pledges have kind of become the first step into signing a bit of a charter. Um, next slide, please. And our charter really kind of champions that, okay, well, we know we've got a problem. That's our oath, that's our pledge. But where are we? What's our baseline? Um, importantly, where do we want to get to? And then it needs to be a two-way dialogue. How are we gonna get there? What help do we need? So our charter challenges organizations of to put in your baseline data. What is your percentage of females and working in your industry? What level are they up to? Up to how many people are you interviewing um, at your organization? How many are women? How many have been shortlisted? How many have got a job? But then it also breaks it down even further into a lot of questions around, okay, well, are you welcoming to LGBT plus people? Do you have signposts and support? Do you have flexible working arrangements which are open for everybody? And that's where you are now, but where do you want to get to in five or 10 years time? And you need to have an action plan to support that. But then you've got the Diversity Maritime Programme to really kind of support you, to share your pathway and help other organizations, but also for us to say, okay, well, let's create something. Um, let's make some change here. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, so the charter really just say, it says, where are you up to? Where do you want to get to? And then you've got access to round tables, sweet toolkits and programs. If you just move to the next slide, I'll just run you through a few of those. Now, with the initiatives, they're not just open to our charter organisations, they're very much open to all, but we do use the charter organisations or our champions of change to help us kind of create these. They so let us know what their barriers are, as well as our networks. But then that's where the, the change piece really starts to happen. So we have an interview pool, because what we started to hear through a lot of our charter organisations was, okay, well, we know we're getting a lot of women who are actually applying for our jobs. We're getting a very decent percentage and they're coming to interview and they're not being shortlisted. What's going wrong? And then we started to break down a little bit further and it was like, okay, well, actually, we have really struggled with diverse um, interview panels. We're all males. Now, to be honest, probably a few of us have been there as a female walking into an interview panel. If it is all male, it's a little bit daunting. Um, and so it's really about making sure there is diversity on interview pools. So we've got that there as a resource, it's free. We've got our speaker bank. We talked about a problem of not having diverse panels. So we don't like to have a problem without a solution. So we've created the speaker bank, um, which has then got a bank of um, women, um, technical women to speak on uh, panels, but it's also got our male allies who can talk about LGBT plus um, um, issues, about mental health and well-being, about ethnicity and race, about social mobility. And we're really trying to take that speaker bank to the next level. We've got toolkits. We've got ethnicity and maritime book club. Um, and we obviously run very regular webinars as well around menopause, organisational change, 
Um, we had one at lunchtime today, which is probably why I'm getting so tongue tied, uh, which kickstarted Black History Month. Um, we've done lots of webinars around LGBT plus history month, creating a culture of care and the holistic approach for mental health and wellbeing, public speaking, and uh, a number more. And again, they're all free. Um, we warmly welcome you all with open arms to join any of those. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to let you know that we're just about to come into all of our networks meeting again. Um, and again, welcome anyone um, on the panel today or in the audience to join any of our sessions. And I put the link at the bottom there. Um, but our mental health network meets tomorrow um, from 10 until 12. They're all via Zoom. Um, that will be talking about the Mental Health and Maritime Pledge. Our survey that's going to be opening at the weekend on World Health Mental Health Day. Our creative and culture care work. We've then got our Women's Network meeting on Wednesday. That's going to be further discussions that we had during Shipping Week on a Women in Summit. Because what we start to say is, okay, well, we're good at talking to ourselves, we're getting better, but how do we share with other similar transport sectors? So we had the first Women in Summit, which brought together women in rail, women in transport, and women in aviation internationally to start looking at a diversity index and a wider diversity index. So we'll be talking about that on the 6th, as well as menopause support. Our ethnicity network comes back together on the 12th of October. We'll be continuing the discussions around Black History Month and also next steps for that network. And last but certainly not least, our Pride Network meets again on the 13th of October. And that is going to be talking about, um, very excitingly, a Pride and Maritime Day that we're going to be looking to launch next February. And also continuing the discussions about how can we ensure maritime is welcoming for our LGBT plus people. So that is um, my presentation. Um, I feel like I kind of flitted through it. But again, I really want to make sure we've got enough time for questions. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for, for that wonderful talk. Um, and uh, there's a link just on your last slide there for everyone. We'll make sure that we pick that up and share that as well, um, maybe in the chat or over email, but so that you can actually go and potentially sign yourselves up for any of those events. Um, I know I'll be doing that straight after this as well, because um, there's a few there that I think would be really useful. Um, thank you again to all of our panel. Um, there's so much that's been brought up within just those three presentations um, that I think would be really good to, to cover as much as we can of that. Um, and firstly, as well, before we get into the Q&A, um, just to say, you know, I think that what we're doing here is just sharing experience um, and perspectives on this. It's really um, important that we all make space for everyone's voice within this conversation. Really keen to um, hear both from your experience, but maybe where you would like to do something differently or to hear more perhaps uh, about any of the ways in which our panellists have explored diversity and inclusion in a little bit more detail. Hopefully all of that will get to explore together um, in this Q&A. Um, so we are going to go to that section uh, of this forum now. Um, we've got some questions uh, for our panel uh, to start us off. Do please post your questions in the chat or um, just to change it up a little bit. Um, if you would like to speak to our panel directly, um, please just uh, turn your um, video on, wave at us and we will notice you and come see you. Um, because I think speaking in person is actually lovely and it's quite nice to just break out of the chat room for um, function a little bit. But so it's entirely up to you. Post your questions on the chat or just wait for this and we'll come to you in the in the Q&A. Um, but where to start? There's so much. Uh, perhaps to start it off, um, I would like to put a question to all three of you, if that's OK. And I think throughout this, it'd be really good if maybe we could get all three of yours um, perspectives on this. Um, we've obviously within that talked a lot about um, maybe some of the initial barriers um, for people wanting to engage with the sector um, who just don't know maybe how they can overcome that. And um, they've already got that interest within them, but they just feel like actually just walking into the environment's too intimidating, or perhaps what they can offer, it doesn't immediately feel like that's something that would be a benefit perhaps. Um, or also there's the other side of it, which is people maybe who don't know they've got the interest yet, but actually what we do covers plenty of what they are interested in, but we just need to be able to communicate that better. Um, so my first question was really around that those barriers. Um, but in particular, 
to ask you, what are maybe some of the more surprising barriers that you've come across um, when you've been looking at diversity and inclusion? Um, something that perhaps maybe doesn't immediately come to mind, but maybe through experience, you've realised that there's something that needs to be addressed more um, on a particular area. Um, Hannah, maybe I could come to you first and then I can go to Linda and Chrissy. Oh, and yes, yes, just to amuse as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, really good, really good question. Um, I think a surprising barrier or something that I've noticed really um, getting involved in sailing and, and kind of maritime work from a young age is I think the amount of people um, coming out of who coming out of kind of academia, I suppose, uh, like 16, 17, who aren't particularly academically minded and that there's there isn't really a stepping stone for them to whoever they are, wherever they are to at least try or um, get comfortable with some of the work that might be really perfect for them. I live in I live in Devon and I went to a, a, a school here and I just know a lot of people that uh, didn't go to university or something and did a, have, have done other kind of like hands on skills. And I look at all of, like the different boat building colleges that we have across the UK and different shipbuilders and things. And I do think that they would be perfect for that. They've got the right mind for it. I don't particularly. <laughs> so I just I can see, you know, that, that was just something that as I was part of the program I could just see that a lot of people would be perfect for certain roles I think and unfortunately it is how do you get those people interested in it or at least trying it <laughs> from a young age um, and, I've, and I've talked to a couple of people about this um, and I think it is just it's it's I suppose it's kind of just making them aware from a younger age but that's very hard to do um you know you can go to you can go to a museum when you're nine but you probably won't think that that's like a career for you um you know so yeah I think that would probably be the main barrier that I noticed yeah I, I can certainly um speak to that I think from our uh, experience here at National Institutes and with this program that there's there's a host of young people out there that um, obviously this isn't necessarily something that appears within their career talks at school. Um, and I know coming out of SHGPT, what we found from uh, feedback from trainees is that um, th they just didn't realise that this was something that they could get involved in. And so that speaks a lot um, about maybe perhaps also how we can communicate the sector and where we communicate it and um, you know making sure that we're actually reaching the audiences we want to but on the platforms that they use rather than maybe sticking to something that feels tried and tested um, I mean Linda just coming to you from your experience is there something that you've encountered that was a bit of surprise and then you've had to adapt along the way? Um, yeah I mean just following on from what you were saying it was interesting that you know obviously we we know the value of what we can offer but when one of our traineeships was linked to Fife College so we had trainees who were school leavers who were tra training with us two days a week and going to college three days a week and just what you were saying just actually the the learning providers and the school career system being aware that we were there and we could actually fulfill some of these things for them because they were doing like a, a practical joinery course um, at the college. But then the thought that actually, but you could get relevant experience working on traditional boats in a boatyard was not something that they'd come across before at all. Um, so that was, that was really interesting just because as I say, we're very aware and we're, we're always reaching out to education providers and saying, look what we can help you deliver and look what we can provide for you as resources and hands on resources and um, just to get away from that classroom learning all the time. Um, but yeah, it was that awareness gap, which I think was was quite tricky. And I think it's very I mean, obviously, it's very commendable that that young school leavers who are going out with it, maybe not very many qualifications are pushed into either work or training or something but it's it's very formalized and 
a volunteer placement or a, a placement in a in a maritime heritage set, setting wouldn't necessarily fall in within that structure. So it, it's how do you align with those other wider um, motivations for young people? I think it's a bit of a, a tricky conundrum that we came across. Yeah, I know it's really interesting. And, and Christy, does that sort of speak to your experience as well as you've been going through your your groups and your you know your working groups and working together with other organisations? Um, and is there something that you think from your experience we should be doing differently, perhaps? Yeah, it's interesting. And it was it's something I don't feel like I have much more to add apart from to completely agree that I think. So often students just have no idea about the, what maritime actually is, about the range of opportunities. But I think maybe it's kind of changing it to be around the future. And what is an engineer going to look like in the future? It's probably not going to be necessarily the engineer that you see now. Um, but I think also it's about sharing the lived experiences. Um, I don't want to use the word role models because that just seems wrong. It seems to put them up on a pedestal. But it's about sharing the lived experience. And this is this is me, this has been my journey. Um, you can be like me, um, you can learn from me, I'm gonna learn from you. And I think that's gonna be so critical. I think as we, well, at Maritime UK, we've got a fabulous ambassadors program. And it's about actually making sure our ambassadors are diverse, that when they go into schools and share their lived experiences, the school kids actually see, oh yeah, okay, well that is someone like me, I can be doing that. But then we're really kind of talking about the green agenda of the future and that roles will be a bit different. Um, but apart from that, I don't think I have, but what Adam Hart would completely agree is definitely a very common theme through all of our networks and through our webinars and discussions as well. I love that what you were saying about the, the ambassadors actually and um, it's interesting as and Hannah you're one of them obviously as somebody who uh, went through the program as a trainee but you are such a great ambassadors in ways that I think um, did it, it didn't exist even just sort of like five ten years ago so that we have trainees posting um, their journey and their stories on places like Twitter but particularly Instagram it's so visible and a picture can tell a thousand words of exactly what they're doing day to day or a video even better um, and we've been hearing from trainees about how they've been then approached by young women in, who wanting to get into the sector um, who send somebody that looks like them and they're around the same age and perhaps maybe that's a, a good starting place to at least have a conversation about it so I love what you were talking about that and we've actually just had a comment as well from uh, Alan Dixon uh, from SS Explorer, which I'll just read out to you and um, just to say great points um, and that they find the same with their careers at sea, uh, at sea ambassador volunteering um, and that there are so many skills that just don't know the career possibilities that are out there. Um, and I think that that was something uh, to Alan's point that we found particularly helpful when we were doing the recruitment, although I'm sure there's still plenty of things that we could do differently or would do differently, that when we were trying to reach new audiences, it was um, trying to focus maybe around what those core skills are that they would need on a day to day basis. And so some of that doesn't necessarily have to be any sort of like background in woodworking or boating or anything like that. It could just be they have good people skills. And if they're going to be on board with groups um, from all types of backgrounds, that's very useful. And that's a really good starting point. Um, so thank you, Alan, um, for, for your comment there. Um, and, you know, obviously we've been sort of talking about barriers and uh, pathways and the traineeship being, being a part of that and that being a key theme for, for yourself, Linda. Um, and we touched on this uh, just between the presentations, but there is um, a funding aspect to this as well, which I think is really important maybe to mention. Um, obviously the SHGP2 is a Heritage Lottery Skills for the Future um, programme. Um, it has an end date and we're aware, very aware of that. Um, so what happens when that sort of funding ends? But um, maybe Linda, I could start with you just to dig a little bit deeper into that. In um, when we're looking at what support organisations can receive from funding bodies, um, is there something in particular that you think um, needs more support of or that you've just found really helpful? Um, yeah, I, I think the funding element was critical for us um, in enabling us to 
take part in all of these traineeships because we have um the will and and we 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 have the the infrastructure now to to support trainees but it's it's one of these ironies that the very people that you're trying to attract the young people people potentially from disadvantaged backgrounds people maybe who don't live in your area but you know live somewhere away from the sea who haven't had those experiences are the people who don't have the money to you know drop everything for a year and spend a year on a traineeship um and without the, the bursary or a or accreditation so it, so that it is aligned to a, a college so it's it's funded through that kind of provision um for them i think it's very very difficult and also as an organization um as i say we depend heavily on volunteers it is easier to ask staff to deliver a structured program than it is to ask that of volunteers um who have their own motivations for volunteering and 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 what they want to do so i yeah I, I it's a very difficult question to answer i mean we have benefited from things like the kickstarter scheme which has been great um and we have um obviously that's that's funded um we've had other trainees through various places we've had students on placement while they've been doing their colleges their, their college courses um but one of my concerns with this is that you're you're opening up at entry level which is great and getting more people into the sector but then what's the next step what how what's the next kind of path that opens up when they finish up um and if they can move, move on to employment and that's that's brilliant that's wonderful but it's it's where do you go after you've had that door open and had your your eyes opened and had a taster for what this you know, wonderful sector can provide. What happens next when when you reach the end of your funded placement, or what happens next as a museum where you've you've reached the end of the, of the the funded project, and you're thinking, well, we've we've built up all this goodwill now. We've we've got our volunteer body and our staff really keen and happy to support volunteers. We've got our structures in place, but now we can't actually afford to bring anybody else in. So, um, yeah. I, I don't know is the short answer. I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from. And obviously, yeah, that, that's a, a huge area with um, with SHTP2. It's that uh, are the jobs there at the other side of the of the training. And as you say, you build up such goodwill across the you know, partners and the trainees themselves, and then it all disperses. Um, so you know, is, are there ways in which we can bring people back together? Um, is it about creating our own, you know, we're all our own ambassadors to be able to sort of sh uh, share the message, if you like. But I mean, Hannah, what was your experience just from moving from SHTP2 and then going into the working environment? Um, yeah, I mean, I was um, pretty, to, it was hard actually, because I don't think I was prepared to, well, museum jobs, as Linda just said, museum, museums, uh, yeah, there aren't many jobs in the museums. It's very saturated anyway, even more so if you're looking at maritime museums in the UK, suddenly it's really a small selection. Um, and I wasn't particularly sure I wanted to go that way. I knew I didn't want to sail um, full time. And I, I knew I'm, I'm not very, I'm not a very um, exact boat builder. <laughs> I'm a bit of a rough, a bit rough-handed, so I was I was at a bit of a loss, I must say, and I um, actually just saw uh, the name Eco Clipper come up um, in I think it was a Guardian article actually, with Yorna Langeland, the guy who the guy who started it, um, an interview with him, and I just messaged him on a whim, just kind of thinking maybe I'll they were kind of offering internships at the time, so I said, well that that might work because you're telling the story of tra uh, traditional ships and, and how they are so necessary and relevant in this world. Um, and it, once again, it's that kind of, it's those stories that I'm interested in. Um, and because this industry looks like it will go, you know, there are, it's gonna go somewhere. There are more and more organizations and more vessels joining as we speak. Um, I think it's a really interesting sector that could get those skills that we're talking about um, kind of active. But I was very fortunate in all of that. And I think 
um, uh, I think a lot of people have just kind of gone into volunt volunteering at, at different museums or heritage sites um, for the time, yeah, for the time being, or going actively sailing, sailing on tall ships or traditional vessels in the UK. Um, and it is really hard. And I think it is, it is that lack of funding, that lack of kind of, uh, yeah, kind of very obvious um, roles where you can, you know, easily slot into um, is, is quite hard. But, uh, but yeah, like I say, hopefully with the sail cargo industry, there might be another one. I don't know, maybe that's really possible. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's amazing that, that, you know, just message and have a go sort of <laughs> approach to actually finding employment, which I know is incredibly difficult. And often that, that works wonders because, um, you know, it says, it says a lot about your capabilities, obviously, of just being able to approach people and communicate. Um, I mean, I think, you know, what, you, what you've said at the end there as well um, about the, the messaging uh, and the roles that are within the, the actual um, careers on offer. Um, it's, it's particularly interesting because there's something about maybe going through a trainee programme, coming out the other side, but not where it may be fitting in between roles so you obviously when you're maybe searching you see a lot of heads of or managers of um but then there's also maybe a sort of uh, psychological step of actually just moving yourself forward from feeling you know i have done my traineeship and now i'm ready to enter the sector as a as somebody who has those skills and that's what i've gone through um i mean chrissy again coming to to yourself with the groups and the people that you talk through um is there that sort of communication of the, the roles or is there much talk I'm wondering around, um, uh, you know, well, we've got maybe uh, a small workforce as it is or a volunteer based workforce and people who perhaps, as we've been talking about in the presentations, don't have a lot of time to pass on those skills and that that's a barrier rather than necessarily it just all being um, closed off to and, you know, creating a diverse workforce. Is there, um, what's your experience of that? Is there much sort of ways that you've thought about working through it yeah it's a really interesting one because it's something and obviously I, i'm quite lucky because i've got maritime skills commission as well and the skills commission has been set up to really kind of look at the future skills and it's it's certainly it's a very kind of common theme and i think um i was actually just kind of jotting down a few notes while everyone was speaking and i think an actual barrier is we don't have good data in maritime uh, when I look at Maritime UK, we don't actually know the percentage of women that we've actually got employed as a whole um, across Maritime, because if we say you would look at our seafarers, we can look at the number of cadets, so we've just reported on that through the Seafarer Cadet Review, then are we looking at um, the makeup of um, hospitality, of cleaners, like when are we looking at, then we're looking at that shore base as well, are we bringing those together? So I think data is actually a big fundamental problem and we've been very fortunate that we're speaking to the Department of Transport and obviously through the Skills Commission we really do want to get to that point of having the data but it's such a big journey we look at other sectors so like rail where they've got um well, I remember the acronym now um the National Skills Academy for Rail and it took them five years with their modeling to get any sort of baseline data and it's actually in some ways not easy for them to gather but because it's actually coded a lot easier, it's taken them five years. It's going to take us a long time to get to that. So I think that has definitely been a barrier um, and will continue to be a barrier. Um, but I think also it's about, we do feel that when someone has gone to sea, they're going to stay at sea and how do they actually move ashore? Um, and we've set up a new qualification called Careers into Maritime Ashore with the Maritime Skills Commission, which is exactly for that reason. Um, I don't know if I've just added any value to that conversation or whether I've just gone around a massive example, but that's certainly some of the conversations we've been having. No, that's that's really helpful. I mean, and, and obviously we are talking about about skills. I think that that's the re that's sort of the such at the heart of all of this is that, um, as I said, the the research that we were doing back in 2013, 2014 was showing that there is this danger that we're going to lose skills. That's the key risk for us, that, that the skills are going to be lost. And therefore, ultimately, there's a risk to the vessels that we care so much about. Um, and one of the ways in which we can mitigate that is by 
opening up the workforce and getting new perspectives and getting new people involved. Um, so I, I think that's such a good point. And uh, just to shamelessly plug as well, we are actually looking at skills training specifically uh, on um, Thursday at 11 o'clock with the forum, um, which I'll share the details off at the end. Uh, so there's plenty to explore with there, but I really feel like the two um, conversations do overlap um, so massively. Um, we have a question from someone in our audience. Uh, it's Alan Dixon from SS Explorer. Um, he's asking, one of the slides mentioned inclusive language. Um, do any of the panel have any tips or places to look at um, for uh, help, finding help that can make language um, used in role descriptions or job adverts and blogs more inclusive? That's a really good question, actually. Um, Who's going first? Chrissy, do you mind if I pick on you again <laughs> to go first and then I can pass to Linda and then Hannah? Yes, of course. So I think, um, yeah, language is absolutely key. We actually, um, we published a piece on this, goodness, last year, um, and it's again something we're continuing to have. In terms of tips and tricks for job descriptions um, and job efforts, I found a really great decoder um, which I've actually been using quite a bit. We've got it in the toolkits on diversity and maritime. Um, if I can dare to multitask, I might get wrong. I'll try and find the link and I'll share that. Um, if I can't do it now, then I'll share it later. Oh, we find that absolutely fabulous. And I've been really mindful that even when we've been recruiting for Maritime UK, I always stick our job descriptions through that. Um, and we're certainly seeing that from some of our charter organisations, they've been using it as well, and they've, they've seen that it has worked. Um, blogs on how, oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, blogs on how to be more inclusive. Um, we've been trying to have this discussion a lot, um, and we continue to have this discussion because um, there are no kind of firm answers. We've been talking um, around uh, racial microaggressions and, and other microaggressions recently. We had some quite big chats on it during um, Shipping Week, and I can certainly put the links to those um, up. Um, I don't have the answers. I find that Dakota works, but it's certainly something we need to continue to learn and discuss. And um, I'm more open and all ears if anyone's got any ideas of things that worked in other organisations and other sectors as well. Um, I think we need to like, stop talking necessarily to ourselves the whole time and actually see what's working in other sectors too. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I, I think um, something that we found particularly helpful for SHTB2, although also helpful for another piece of work we did where we were looking at um, accessibility um, within our sector, both um, sort of physical and non-physical barriers. Um, the most helpful, helpful things seem to be, well, there are groups out there that you know, that is the core aim, perhaps, of what they're doing day in, day out, and actually just talking to them. They might have nothing to do with maritime, um, but they may be very local to you. And um, that's a very useful way to understand the issue better, but also perhaps reach an audience that they talk to on a daily basis to be able to let them know that it is something that we're interested in and there's another route there for you. And um, Linda, so is there anything that you wanted to add to that as you've maybe put your job descriptions together? Is there been something useful um yeah i mean I, I agree with with everything that you, you you and chrissy have just said but um the only thing that we've been specifically looking at in addition to that is um, we've done a lot of work with um opening up the sector to non-graduates and people who potentially maybe don't have much of a an awareness or a background or training in museums um, and just trying to cut out jargon, things that we, we know we understand, and also just thinking with every role that we're advertising, you know, sometimes the default can be, you know, we ask for a degree or whatever, do we actually need that? And we, all of our jobs now, if, even if we do decide, yes, we do need somebody who's got a degree, we will say postgraduate museum qualification or equivalent experience or you know something else just so it doesn't have to be a single route so that you're not putting um barriers in place even with with what you're asking for and i think it's also as well as the the, the language that you use i think it's also where where you put it where where you show it to people i think that's key as well and um, just making sure that that the people that you're targeting it at um can find it yeah, absolutely. Um, again, just to share what 
perhaps maybe we can uh, what may be helpful for for any others who uh, might be able to learn from lessons learned in shtp2 um there are uh, I'll, I'll see if i can find links as i'm talking just now but I'm, i will be able to share some of maybe the hashtags in particular that we used again i feel like they um are really useful if you're using social media to be able to um let people know that you have a, a job or a place coming up um, also as well, just to mention that we do have our own crew page for anyone who looks um, for people to actually come on board their operational vessel. Um, if you would like to use that crew page because you have a placement, um, we'd be very happy to talk about the type of language maybe being used and to just have a conversation around it. Um, I think you're right, Linda, it's sometimes cutting out the jargon, um, not maybe using words that are only familiar to you within the sector, um, but also as what we found useful was um, looking again at maybe some of those soft skills. So really thinking perhaps about what type of person you're looking to bring on board. How much time commitment have you got to be able to train someone up? And if the answer is, well, we're looking to be able to train someone up, um, then let them know that and that they don't maybe have to come um, sort of polished, ready to go on the first day. And there is that time to be able to uh, show them the skills and bring something out in them. Um, Hannah, I mean, communications officer at Eco Clipper, you've obviously been, I think a lot about on a daily basis of communicators. Is there something that you would share on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I we, we have a, a group of interns who um, I manage and when, uh, I mean, most of when we've been recruiting, it's all been online through Zoom because no one's, uh, well, pandemic is on. Um, so that's been really interesting because how do you really know what someone wants, what someone uh, needs on a screen? Um, so our, what I've tried to do is through our recruitment process, just be as not kind of informal, but as relaxed as possible, I think. Um, and I, the, the people that we have recruited, um, it come from all sorts of backgrounds. I mean, some of them are, uh, studying at university and it's like a long side thing. Um, some just need some experience, um, post uni, some people have experience. They just need to fill some time and they want to have something on their CV. Um, and I think it's, it's being flexible for them. I mean, this is a really specific case because it is an internship. So we're not, you know, we can't demand anything from them too much. And, you know, it's kind of a real two way street with that. But certainly it's just kind of a, a, as relaxed a, a play as possible. And, and the communication is really open between us all, um, which I think has really benefited us. We've got some we've got a great team at the moment. So, um, yeah, I would say that. Um, yeah. That's really helpful. And, and Chrissy, you were talking in your presentation around diversity on your interview panels. Now, obviously, that panels can look really different. And it could be perhaps that you as an organisation do go for a more formal approach. Um, I've been in interviews with huge, massive oak tables between me and then a big, big gap and then five other people. And that's very intimidating. Um, or it can be, you know, that actually the interview is taking place down in the pub. Um, so thinking about all of the different environments that maybe this is happening, but just thinking about maybe, yeah, introducing that diversity from your and presenting yourself maybe as a diverse organisation. Um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as mentioned, like, the interview pool was really established because of a problem that was identified. Um, and it initially kind of stemmed about gender equality, but we also know that it's about more than that. We need to make sure that uh, interview panels are inclusive um, and interviewers are inclusive. Um, so I don't know how much, I can really talk about like kind of the format of meetings, because obviously, being Maritime UK and an umbrella body, but we're actually unbelievably small. And I probably would never get to the technical details of organisations about how they interview. But it's certainly about making sure that if they do identify as having a problem with diverse panels, um, we've got a solution there for them. But actually what we have found at the barrier is um, we start to find that we, at the start when we launched it, we had lots of people sign up for um, to sit on interview panels, but then they kind of stopped. We're like, okay, 
why is it stopping? So we went back to our networks again and we said to people, why aren't you signing up to volunteer? And we started to find they were actually nervous. They were like, oh, I've never actually been an interviewer before. How do I be a good interviewer? And we're like, oh, okay, that's an interesting one. Look, because this one thing I don't know all the technical details of the role. And it was very much about like, oh, that'd be up to the organization. There's all there for them. But it's really to have that diversity of thought um, and that visible diversity, if it is a visible um, inclusive panel, or the really like, that diverse perspective to bring into it and to challenge. So now what we're actually going to start doing is we're going to release some tips and tricks on how to be an interviewer, not necessarily the best interviewer, because what is a best interviewer, but how to actually sit on the panel, what it can mean. Um, so that's going to be the next steps coming out. So I don't feel like I can properly answer your question, but I can certainly signpost you to that initiative that's out there. No, that, that's really helpful. And um, I mean, just to just to share Alan's uh, comments again, he's just saying great thanks. So I, I think all of this is actually going somewhere. And also um, James Buff, uh, sorry, James Duff also from SX Explorer says that it's very interesting. He's given him lots to think about. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting point, actually, that you've just raised, because obviously there's the recruitment side of it. Um, but I, there is something that I really wanted to explore a bit more, which is once you've maybe got past that point, so say you are doing a great job with your recruitment, everything's looking really diverse, you've got a real mix of people from different backgrounds and different skill sets. Um, but then how do you keep that going on the day-to-day -day work? Um, how do you make sure that that mentality is being spread across the team? Um, if it's not, how do you address it? Um, and you know, something that we talked about as well in the sort of setup to this was, you know, there are issues around ongoing well-being and mental health. Um, and what no one wants is for, you know, our job or a trainee placement to um, somehow be a negative impact on that. Um, so it, it seems to me that you're right. There's something about, you know, um, training up the workforce itself in situ to be able to take uh, diversity on board and make sure that it continues on day to day. Um, so that's a big sort of intro to a, a question, if you like, and I know that this is a big topic. Um, but I mean, maybe Hannah asking you about, again, going back to your SHTP2 experience or any other experiences that you've had, um, you know, from that early experience on board. Um, did you, you know, looking back, would there be any recommendations you would make to somebody who is perhaps, you know, responsible for you in that place and of something that you maybe think that could have been done differently and so I'm going to do it differently going forward? Yeah, um, I think this is a really, really vital um, and a really vital point and actually it's kind of another barrier really. Um, I'm thinking specifically now uh, on board working ships or perhaps in a working no, on board working ships. Um, it's it's that uh, it's that understanding that someone's experience might not be your own. And I was talking to a female rigger um, a while ago, and she was working on board a, a ship, and they brought on school kids. And it was I don't know, she must I think it was like a fourteen year old group, um, something like that. And one of the kids was trans. And they were, you know, everyone had to change in front of each other. And, you know, you have to feel really comf comfortable kind of walking through to get to go to the toilet when other people are sleeping and all of these things. And, and I think I'm not, I, I couldn't comment on how um, the, the, the crew did with dealing with a, someone who's trans on board, but it is understanding that their experience is gonna be different and there has to be a real respect for that. And I think on board ships, as I've, as I said during my presentation, I've fitted into this kind of very um, narrow view of how someone should be on board a boat. Um, but actually I think we need to look a bit bigger. I, I think we need to take on people other people's experiences and and a bit of empathy and really understand you know maybe maybe a, someone doesn't want to I keep going to taking off the clothes because it's just the most <laughs> for me it's the most obvious um for religious re reasons for example you know you can't demand someone and you can't roll your eyes and go oh yeah you can use that room there you know it, it has to be safe it has to be a safe space for for people to be able to express themselves and do what they want um and I'm 
I've I'm not entirely sure whether um, I mean I, I couldn't I couldn't comment on it, but it makes me very wary that as future generations come up, um, are are the the crews on board ships being trained in that way to be to kind of properly deal with the situation in in, in an effective and open manner without judgment? Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think that that's a really good example. You're right. It does often come back to that uh, example of taking off your clothes or going to the yeah. toilet. <laughs> it's an obvious one, uh, as you say, but it's uh, that feels like an area that's often overlooked. And, um, you know, I think that we've probably all sort of had that experience, but you're right. It, it all comes back to whoever you are on board, that you're going to be coming at it from your perspective. And hopefully you can have a supportive crew around you. Um, and I think everyone gets gets the most out of that situation. Um, I'm just conscious of time. If anyone does have a, a burning question that they would like to put to our panel, it can be the last question that we we take. Please, um, as I say, either wave or it's probably easier if you do put it on the chat at this point. Um, but I just wanted to uh, finish up that conversation with Linda and just wondering, um, you know, as partner coming out of SHTP2, with all of your um, experience as well around that, um, is there like a lesson that you would pass on to somebody else, do you think, around that creating a, a sort of inclusive, supportive environment that's welcoming? Um, thanks, Victoria. That's a really big question. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think, I think, I think all, all everything that we've been talking about so far, I think. I think openness, I think I think it's important to model the diversity that you want to see. So it, it's no use being an all-male organization or an all all um or, or an all-female organization, or you know, if you want to encourage diversity, you've got to actually, you know, be diverse and and support that throughout at all levels um of the organization. You know, we, we've got our first, I think, I think she's our first female chair of trustees at the moment. The the, the board of trustees is, is more female than I've ever known it. They're younger than I've ever known them to be. So that even at that level, I think it's really important. Um, I also just thinking about what Hannah was just saying, I also think it's to be aware that there's there 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 will be reservations in amongst some, you know, if you're working as part of a large organization, some will be more on board with this than others. Some will be more ready to welcome people than others. And being aware of that is the first step to dealing with it. And some people might be genuinely intimidated by new people coming in with new ideas. Um, and sometimes, you know, we've had issues where a new trainee is brought in and they're seen to be getting all these wonderful opportunities that established members of staff potentially are not getting because they're not part of the funded program and it's you know you can build up these little resentments which is not anybody's fault and it's managing those and making sure that it's not threatening to to, to bring new people in and have new ideas coming into the team um so yeah i would say just be be, be open and be aware and and model model what you want to what you want to be no I think that that's really good advice and you answered the difficult question there really well I think if we can take anything away that's that's exactly what we want to see from this forum um so again just very conscious time I think we've got time just for one quick fire question if you like and feel free as well to repeat because we have shared a lot of sort of pop tips already um so if there's something you really want to underline panelists this is your chance um but yes if you could sort of give somebody your top tip if you like the one thing that if they could look at uh, or um, do better uh, you know what would that be whether it's about recruitment whether it's about doing something differently day to day um is there something that you would be able to pass on to everybody here um chrissy perhaps i could start with you with that difficult question that is a difficult question i think it's about sharing share your learning share your experience share the good the bad the ugly because no matter where you've got to your pathway, it's going to help somebody else. Share your good experiences, share what hasn't worked and why it hasn't worked, and share what has been absolutely horrendous because it will never, ever be a failing. It's a journey. That would be my biggest tip. That's perfect. And uh, Linda, could I pass to you for yours? 
Um, yeah, I would say challenge yourself um, because as, as Chrissy says, it, it is a journey and you, you know, is, is there, a, is there a, a new step that I could be taking? Is there a different way I could be thinking about this issue? We've come this far, is it far enough? Could we go further? Could we do things differently? And actually not, not just thinking about us, but me personally, what can I do? and challenge yourself personally because you know fundamentally we're only responsible for our own actions so you know um yeah start with yourself <laughs> that's perfect and hannah if you would like to close us off that would be great um i would say communicate to inspire uh, i think that's the way that you can truly get someone anyone interested in this industry and um, and then continue to do exactly what Linda and Chrissy just said. <laughs> Absolutely, I'd agree with all of your points. And I think that you're all right when you say, you know, it's a journey, there are mistakes that are going to be made, there are things that you would do differently, but it's only experience that will get you to that point. Um, and that sharing absolutely everything, whether it's the skeletons in the closet, as much as sort of the good, uh, the good stories and things in progress that you've made is only going to, to hopefully help the sector more. Um, and certainly this talk has been incredibly informative to me and how I think National Historic Ships will continue to grow this conversation amongst the sector too. Um, so thank you to all, all three of you for joining us today and sharing. Um, it's been really important, I think. Um, thank you as well to everyone for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. And I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Um, we've had some really good conversations there. And if you find yourself later wishing that maybe you'd asked a question or there's something that you're thinking about still um, later on in the day, um, do get in touch and email those thoughts to us or those questions. Um, we'll gladly sort of, you know, do our best to answer them or pass them around the panel so that we can keep this conversation moving. Um, so, as I say, this is a huge topic, of course, um, that doesn't end just for today's session. Um, so, as well as, you know, any thoughts and questions that might come out of this, um, do keep in touch if you would like to share any case studies that perhaps maybe, um, or I should say any experience that you think maybe would make a good case study um, that we could share through our Shipshape Network and through the National Historic Ships UK website. Um, we would really like to uh, encourage sort of sharing experience and knowledge um, and using our website as a source for that. And um, so we'd love to hear from you. Um, also, just to mention that we will be publishing our project evaluation report on our website uh, next month. Um, so do keep an eye out for that if you are interested in reading more about the project. Um, as I also mentioned, uh, this talk is part of something we're calling Skills Week. Um, so all along, all across our social media, we'll be looking at uh, issues around diversity and inclusion, but also specifically the type of skills that can serve our historic vessels, keep them operational. Um, and on Thursday, we have our second uh, forum, which looks at skills training, um, and we'll be hearing from guest speakers who are trying to do that on the ground or have aspirations, and perhaps maybe um, they have questions that they would like to uh, explore more with the audience. So um, go on our social media to find the link to be able to sign up for that if you haven't already. Um, but for now, I will start to close it there. Thank you again to all of our speakers and for you to, for attending. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.